Thank you very much for uh, for these introduction words. And as I was saying, this contest masterclass is all about organizing contest, knowing what we need to do at the club level, area level, division level, and beyond, so that we are putting in place the best possible organization for all of our members to compete, judge, or provide help as we go through um, the process. So what we're going to do is go through a number of topics uh, on this particular agenda. What I plan on doing is probably talk for about 40, maybe 45 minutes. I'll see how it goes. And after that, I will I definitely want to keep some time for question and answer because I'm sure you all have a number of questions. So what we are going to do first is answer that very important question. Why do we run speech contest? So first of all, it is a great showcase of our best speakers in a district. So that is very important to keep in mind. But second, and pretty much on a level playing field with it, it's also an opportunity to learn because for all of us that have competed in contests before, doing a speech at a club level is completely different to doing a speech in a club contest. So we learn so much by going to the next step, competing at the club area division and beyond. So this is a really strong learning event. It's also a great opportunity to engage our members differently to our regular club environment. It's an opportunity to do some outreach, whether we are trying to grow our membership at a club level or beyond. It is important to have those events as an opportunity for more public relations um, that will essentially entice perhaps people from our communities, our workplace to come and join and uh, experience what a contest is and who knows, maybe even become members. It's also an opportunity to strengthen the links across our membership, whether it's across clubs, across areas, across division or across our entire district and why not beyond as well. And last but certainly not least, by organizing those contests, you are also putting yourself in a position of leadership, whether you are a contest organizer, a contest chair, a club president, an area director, a division director, a program quality director, a chief judge, you will take on some roles that are clear leadership roles and that is something to also keep in mind. So this is why, in a nutshell, we run speech contests. There are more reasons, but that's what I wanted to share with you today. Now in District 91 for this program year 2024-25, there are a number of things I wanted to uh, share with you. The first of, uh, of all the, uh, the points that are very important is that this year for area level upwards, all contests must now be held in person. You will have heard, no doubt, that the board, uh, Toastmasters International Board, made that decision way back in the early part of 2024. This was also uh, discussed at the District Executive Committee meeting on 1st of September and re-emphasized earlier this morning at our District Council meeting. What is also very important to remember is that this year, the district elected to continue with our historical contest that we have had in District 91 and not introduce the new online contest. So what that means is that this autumn, we will run the humorous and table topic contest. And then next spring, we will be running the international and evaluation speech contest. So that's in a nutshell where we are today. Now, there is also something else that is very important to remind ourselves of, and uh, uh, that was also confirmed by our district director earlier this morning at our district council meeting, that eight weeks prior to an area contest, if an area has four assigned clubs or fewer in good standing, the district has the option and has elected to use that option to allow two contestants from each club to compete at the area level. And equally, for those three divisions, I believe, uh, B, C, and K, that have four or fewer areas assigned, two contestants will progress to the division contest as well. Something to keep in mind if you're an area division director, these rules have been confirmed by our program quality director and district director earlier today. Now, it is also important to remind ourselves that each club in good standing is permitted to choose its contestant for each area speech contest by whatever means the club desires. But of course, if a club contest is held, it must comply with the rules in the rulebook and the contest result will be final. 
And the reason I say this is very simply that we have had instances before where a contest was held, only one contestant was present and ended up being over time. That means that contestant must not progress to the next level, even though that may have been the only contestant. Very, very important to do this and keep, uh, and, and, and keep that rule in mind. Now, eligibility, I know this is always the, uh, the sticky point and the point that makes contest chairs and chief judge grow a lot of gray hair, lose their hair, uh, or certainly just like me, start to lose quite a lot of it. So how do you check the eligibility? So first of all, make use of the eligibility ass assistance that Toastmasters International provides us with. It's available on the district website, uh, on the, sorry, on the Toastmasters International website, and is available to every, um, uh, every one of our members. With this eligibility assistant, you can check which club a member belongs to, their membership status, and which role they have, whether they are club officers, district officers, because all of this will help you create a good picture for whether or not a member is eligible to compete or to judge. Now, it is also very important to remind ourselves that contestants and all judges need, in some circumstances, and I'll go on to the detail in a moment, they need to provide their certificate of completion of level one and level two, wherever it's applicable. Now, I must remind you that only a few days, maybe a couple of weeks ago, Toastmasters International shared an email to all of us as club officers and district leaders that Basecamp will have an outage from the 9th of October until most likely, but not guaranteed, the 25th of October. And that will prevent many of us from accessing useful information like our certificate of completion. So if you are a club officer planning to organize a contest, an area or division director planning to organize an event during those dates, and I would even argue into November, please, 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 please ask your contestant, your judges to download their level one and level two certificates so that their eligibility can be confirmed. Without it, they may not be able to take on those roles. Very important, difficult timing for us, but if I would put my shoes in uh, World Headquarters, there is really no good time to make those changes in, uh, in base camp. And unfortunately, that happens right in the middle of our contest season. But keep that in mind. Do ask your contestants, your judges, to download their level one and level two certificates so that eligibility can be verified. And last, but certainly by no means least, please ensure that each contestant and judges have completed and certified the eligibility statements on the relevant forms. I've put the links to the forms here. This is very important. I will continue and repeat that message throughout today. But those two forms have been updated um, based on the updated 2425 rulebook. Unfortunately, those forms have not yet been updated on the contest kit that you might download from the Toastmasters website. So I've put those updated links here so that you can have the latest copies. But I'll get onto that a little bit later on as well. So that's generic statement around eligibility. Next, as a contestant, to be eligible to compete in a Toastmaster speech contest, a contestant must be a paid member of a club in the area, division or district in which they are competing. The club must also be in good standing. Your membership must also be um, accurate with Toastmasters International. It is not in it is not enough to have paid your club. Of course, maintaining eligibility at all levels is important because very simply, if it is determined at a future stage that you were not eligible for a period of time during which uh, your, your, your membership might have lapsed, maybe for a month or so, you will be disqualified for the next, uh, for the next level. Something very important. It doesn't happen very often, but it does happen from time to time. Now, in addition to be able to compete in the international speech contest, and that's for later on this year, there are a couple of additional requirements, one of which being, as I noted a moment ago, the ability to demonstrate completion of level one and two of any path in a Toastmasters learning program. There are some 
slight variation of the rules for those members belonging to clubs that have been chartered very recently. But this is very sort of detailed, and I'll cover this uh, on the slides as it is here in the last paragraph, and I'll let you um, look at this in the rule book for more information. What is also important for contestant is to be aware of the ineligibility criteria. I'm not going to cover them all, but there are three slides of which are important. If you have any district officer role during the year, you may not compete. If you are the immediate past district director, you may not compete. If you are a candidate for a district position elected by the district council, program quality director, club rules director, division director, you may not compete. And now for a change in this year's rule, members who are serving in contest official or presenter roles that meet the following criteria may not be contestant. And those are voting judges, tie-breaking judges, chief judge at any level in any district at the same contest type in which they would be competing. In plain English, that means that if you are competing at the club level, you may not be a judge in that contest type at the nearby club or a club in a division in a different division or district, as long as it is for that particular contest type. That is a very important statement. However, and I know because this is a question that's been asked before, if, for instance, you are competing at the club level and you do not qualify to the next stage and you finish, I don't know, third, and you're very happy that even though you may be called if first and second are called upon, I cannot make the next level, you will be able to judge as long as you understand that you will not be able to uh, compete should you be called upon to compete uh, if uh, first or second place may not be available. So that's a, a slight um, important detail that um, I want you to be aware of because that is not necessarily preventing you from judging if you were a contestant but didn't go through. So that's a very important point. Timer, ballot counters, sergeant at arms and other contest official for the same contest in which you would be competing. Uh, those rules have been there for a long time. Uh, you cannot be the ballot counter at the contest in which you're competing. All very, very obvious um, statements here. And uh, the last, uh, the, the last two, um, this is not an, a new requirement, a new eligibility statement, but nevertheless something important. No contestant can compete in more than one area speech contest of a given type, even if the two areas are in different divisions or districts. Last but not least, as we've noted, and I'm sure every one of us is very well aware, each contestant must be physically present to compete beyond the club level. What that means, you can do an online or a hybrid contest at the club level only. So very important point to keep in mind here. Next, eligibility for judges and functionaries. Much easier to be eligible to be a judge or functionary, funny enough. At the club level, all you need to be is a paid member. And that's a very important statement. Paid member, that's it. So you could be a paid member of a club with five members or 50 members. You are eligible to be a judge. Now, at the area, division, or district level, there are some additional requirements. Um, one of which is being a paid member for a minimum of six months. You must have also completed a minimum of six speeches in the legacy competent communication manual or earned the certificates of completion in level one and two of any path in a Toastmasters learning experience. At area, division, and district, once again, you must also be physically present at the contest in which you will be judging. For all other roles, you may simply be a paid member. That is very, very important. Last statement, again, goes without saying, but candidates for elected district leader positions for the term beginning the subsequent July 1st are ineligible to serve as a contest official or a test speaker at area, division, and district level. Now, let's talk about the selection sequence. 
Each club in good standing is permitted to choose its contestant for each area speech contest by whatever means the club desires. Sounds familiar? I've mentioned this a moment ago. If the club contest is held, it must comply with the rules of the rule book and the contest result is final. Once again, very important. If you have a club contest, you only have one contestant and that one contestant goes under or over time, for instance, that contestant may not progress to the next stage. Sad, difficult, but unfortunate. Unfortunately, those are the rules. The other important uh, point to keep in mind is uh, uh, should a club area division contest winner be unable to participate, the next level contest, the highest place available contestant will advance to that next level. The international speech contest is the only contest that will proceed beyond the district level. Should a district level Contest winner is unable to participate in quarterfinal. The next highest place contestant will advance to that level. Again, um, we'll get there when we get there, but this is not uh, necessarily very relevant for the time being. Although, if you are planning on being the world champion of public speaking, or your members are planning to be the world champion of public speaking, all of these requirements for speakers, timing, and everything else related to eligibility must be kept in mind. Uh, but I'm sure those individuals will be very um, fluent in uh, contest rules. Now, speech, subject, and preparation. I know there's always a, a number of questions around those, um, those areas, and I wanted to share with you a couple of um, important points, which I think are important to keep in mind. The subject of all international and numerous speech contests must be selected by the contestant. In other words, it must be original. The subject of the table topic contest must be determined by the contest chair. The subject of the evaluation contest speech must be limited to all evaluation of the test speaker's speech. Course contestant must create their own speeches and each must be substantially original, which means 25% or less of the speech may be devoted to quotes, paraphrasing or references to another person's uh, content. But any quoted, paraphrased, or reference content must also be identified um, and called on during the speech presentation. Last but not least at all, contestant must not reference another contestant or a speech presented by another contestant during their speech at the, at the same contest in which they are competing. This is an important one because the wording in the rule this year has slightly changed. Um, and it is important to make sure that contestants are not referencing the contestant or the contestant's speech. Uh, this is new this year. Before it was only the contestant's speech. More preparation and points to keep in mind. The contestant will speak from the platform of the designated area uh, that would have been designated by the contest chair. The contestant, chief judges, voting judges, and all functionaries will be advised of that speaking area before the contest begins, typically by the contest chair when uh, introducing the contest. There may be a, a lectern or a podium available, but this is optional. If amplification, AV, is necessary, a lectern or podium mounted microphone will be available. Again, not required, but possible. And last but certainly not least, all of the equipment must be available for contestants to practice with prior to the contest. And contestants are also responsible for arranging their preferred setup uh, in a quiet manner before being introduced, typically during that one minute silence in between speeches. Now, on to the different um, procedures and a general procedure for the contest at different levels. The rules are similar but slightly different at different levels. So from a general standpoint, at the club level, you must have at least five voting judges, a contest chair, chief judge, tie-breaking judge, ideally two counters and two timekeepers. But there's a very important word in the contest rulebook, unless impractical. So if you have a club and you don't have as many members as you would need to fill all of the roles, clearly you will need to either invite others to do it or simply double up on some of the roles. Ideally, you do not, but again, we are talking club contest, so we need to be pragmatic. Voting judges also, again, perhaps difficult at the club level, 
but in all uh, possibilities, please keep um, voting judges anonymous. At the error contest, the rules evolve slightly. We do not have, um, unless impractical in a statement, so you must have an equal number of voting judges from each club in the area, or a minimum of five. Contest chair, chief judge, tiebreaker, two counters, two timekeepers. Once again, the voting judges must remain anonymous. And as um, um, I noted on the last uh, uh, point, contest officials must not serve in more than one uh, role for the same contest at the area level. Division contest. Again, it's going up a notch a little bit. This time, you must have an equal number of voting judges from each area in a division or a minimum of seven. Contest chair, chief judge, tie-breaking judge, two counters, two timers, fairly simple here. There's a slight additional point here. The chief judge, voting judge, and tie-breaking judge must not be a member of any club in which a contestant is a member. So if you're a division director, that little note here is really, really important. Once again, judges must remain anonymous. Now let's talk about briefings. There's a lot to cover during the briefings. Um, again, you'll get the slides at the end of my session. Please um, do take a look again. I'll try and highlight the key points that I believe are the most important for us to be aware of. Before the contest, the contestants are briefed on the rule of the con by the contest chair. Pretty obvious, but absolutely essential. Contestants will then be uh, drawn for their speaking order by the contest chair. If a contestant is absent from the briefing, that's a very important note because this rule is sometimes either forgotten, unknown, or very simply um, misinterpreted. So if a contestant is absent from the briefing, the alternate speaker, if present, is permitted to attend the briefing in place of the primary contestant. Now, that needs to be taken into consideration with the following two points. If the primary contestant is not present when the person conducting the contest is introduced, then that primary contestant is disqualified and the alternate official becomes the contestant. However, should the primary contestant arrive after the briefing, but before the person conducting the contest is introduced, then that primary contestant is permitted to compete, provided they have filled in all of the relevant forms, eligibility criteria, and so on. And this is a very important one. All the contest here needs to brief all of the contestant. The contestant may not necessarily attend it and still be able to compete. Very, very important to keep in mind. Hopefully, those scenarios don't happen very often, but when they do, it's important to do it right. For the avoidance of any doubt here, the timekeepers um, will provide visual clues um, for the different contests, and I've put that information here. I don't have hours and hours to go over it. I'll leave it here for your uh, reference. Once again, more information for the contest chair briefing. And this is new this year into the rulebook. Upon being introduced, the contestant must proceed immediately to the speaking position. No change here, all the same. But to ensure that each contestant's audiovisual equipment is functional, each contestant must say, thank you, contest chair, after being introduced. If all is well, the contest chair will respond, you're welcome. This is also new to this year's rulebook. The timing will therefore begin when the contestant's next definite verbal or nonverbal communication with the audience happens. Very important. And that's, again, a slight change for the timekeeper to keep in mind. It is no longer the first definite verbal or nonverbal communication, it is the next communication. And that is because of that little dance between contestant and contest chair. The last uh, second bullet point here, nothing new this year, but important to keep in mind. The speaker should begin speaking within a short time after arriving at the speaking area and is not permitted to delay the contest unnecessarily. 
Now let's talk about the chief judge briefing. Before the contest, the voting judges, counters, timers are briefed on their duties by the chief judge. Voting judges, tie-breaking judges will receive the appropriate ballot for the contest. The voting judges and the tie-breaking judges will also receive the judge's certification of eligibility and code of ethics. That form must be signed and returned to the chief judge. The timers will receive the contest time record sheet. The ballot counters will receive the contest um, counters tally sheet. Before the contest, the chief judge will also select a member to act as a tie-breaking judge. The tie-breaking judge does not attend the judge's briefing. And I repeat that, the tie-breaking judge does not attend the judge's briefing. However, it will receive the appropriate tie-breaking judge ballot and tie-breaking judge certification of eligibility and code of ethics. This form must also be signed and returned to the chief judge prior to the contest beginning. More information for the chief judges amongst ourselves. In order for a ballot to be valid, the judges shall complete their ballots by entering the choices of first, second, and third. No ties, please. You must also sign and print your name on the ballot. Failure to do that, this ballot will be invalid and therefore not counted. When the voting judges are finished marking their ballots, they must discreetly provide the bottom portion of the ballot to the ballot counters. The top portion, please use it for the next bonfire. When the tie-breaking judge is finished, marking the ballot by ranking all contestants, and I do repeat, all contestants, not just the first three, every single one of them, they must discreetly provide the bottom portion of the ballot to the chief judge. Equally, everybody at the end of a contest can do a big bonfire, especially if it's in November, and burn all of the top section of um, those ballot forms. As the voting judges and tie-breaking judges are completing their ballots at the end of the contest, the timer will, uh, with the stopwatch, will complete and hand over the timing sheet to the chief judge. Once all the ballots have been completed, the ballot counters and the chief judge will tabulate the result in a private room. Hopefully, those will be um, organized by yourselves as well. Next slide, still on chief judge briefing. In the counting room, I know we should all be able to count to around 25 or 30, but having made errors myself, corrected by a chief judge, and having witnessed counters making errors as a chief judge, it is important to remind ourselves how the counting works. On the counter tally sheet, each contestant receives points for being ranked first, second, or third. Three points for first place, two points for second place, one point for third place. Then we do the tallying. Now, there may well be a tie, in which case you will need, well, the chief judge will need to bring the tie to an end and decide who takes that position. So the tied contestant who receives the highest ranking on the tie-breaking judge ballot will gain the contested place. And any other tied contestant will be ranked in order behind that contestant. Very important. It's a very simple rule once you do it once or twice. But I know from experience, the first time you do it, it catches you by surprise and makes you think, how do I use that sheet, um, um, ballot in order to break a tie? So once again, make sure that you look at the order to break the tie. Timekeeping, again, something for the chief judge to let the timekeepers know about. As we noted earlier, we have two timekeepers appointed by the chief judge. One provided with a stopwatch, that would do the counting, and the other with a signaling device that displays the green, the yellow, and the red colors. The signaling device must be in full view of each contestant, although not necessarily obvious to the audience. The timer with the stopwatch maintains and delivers the chief judge the written record of the elapsed time, and this constitutes the official time. In all speech contests, no signal can be given for overtime period. I'm sure nobody does that, but very important to stick to this rule. And last, but by no means the least, and very important, any visually impaired contestant is permitted to request and must be granted a form of warning signal of their own choosing. 
So if you know that you have somebody visually impaired attending your contest, do reach out. Uh, it would be my recommendation. And don't wait for them to request that information. Be proactive. Um, first, that will be very inclusive of us. But more importantly, that will give everybody the time to also be prepared and give our contestant the best possible experience. I'm not going to go over all of the timing, but once again, humorous international speech, five to seven minutes, table topic, one to two minutes, evaluation, two to three minutes, and there will be disqualifications if going below or above a certain time. I'll let you read those slides in the contest rule book, which, by the way, are verbatim copy and paste from it. So please do reference these timing when performing the judge's briefing. Once again, Similarly to uh, the information provided by the contest chair to the contestant, this is to be provided to the timekeepers by the chief judge so that there are no um, errors and confusion around the timing. The last bullet point here, in the event of technical failure, and I apologize for it to be so small, uh, if there is a technical failure of the signal or timing equipment, a speaker is allowed 30 seconds extra overtime before being disqualified. Hopefully, somebody will have a stopwatch and there won't be any technical failures, but this is something to always keep in mind, that this is a provision in our rulebook. Now, let's talk a little bit about procedures for all of our contests. Broadly speaking, the speakers are introduced. There will be a one-minute silence in between each contestant for the voting judges to complete their ballots. Um, as the voting judges and tie-breaking judge complete their ballots at the end of a contest, the timekeeper will hand over the form to the chief judge. The chief judge will notify the contest when everything is collected. They will retire to a private room to do some very difficult mathematics. There are some contestant interviews. The result form completed by the chief judge with the names of the winners in reverse order is submitted to the contest chair. If there are multiple contests taking place, you may adjourn the contest for the next contest to take place, even if the winners have not yet been announced. The winners must, however, be announced prior to the end of the event. So, for instance, if you're doing an area contest that contains a table topic and humorous speech contest, in this order, you may adjourn the table topic contest to start the humorous speech contest and do the result right at the end. Of course, announcement of the contest winners is final unless the list of winners is announced incorrectly, in which case the chief judge or ballot counter or timers are permitted to immediately interrupt and correct the error. Now, for table topic contest, what do I need to share with you? The contest chair must introduce each contestant by announcing the contestant's name, topic, the topic, and the contestant's name. The contestant must stay out of the room until the preceding speaker has completed their response to the topic. Again, they don't, we don't want to have a contestant knowing the topic in advance. All contestants must also receive the same topic, which, which must be of general nature, and that topic is selected by the contest chair. Now, the same topic provided to all of the contestants is really important. Although I have not witnessed myself contest where the topics was different, I have witnessed on a number of occasions a topic that was spelled slightly differently. Please don't. Make sure that the contest question is spoken out in the same way for all contestants. This will make the experience much more enjoyable for everyone and certainly allow us to stick within the rules. The final point on these slides, perhaps not very well known given some of the topics I've heard over the years, but the topic must be of reasonable length, must not require a detailed knowledge, and must lead to an opinion or a conclusion. Again, taken straight from the rule book here. So please avoid a table topic question that takes five minutes to read out. A bit of an exaggeration, but something to keep in mind. Humorous speech contest. Very similarly, the contest chair will introduce each contestant by announcing the name, the speech title, speech title, and the contestant's name. 
The contestants in this contest are permitted to remain in the same room throughout the duration of the contest. But please do bear in mind that the subject of the humorous speech contest must be selected by the contestant. Again, pretty obvious. Perhaps not so obvious is the speaker must avoid potentially objectionable content, language, anecdotes, or material. Very, very important here. The speech must also be thematic in nature, opening body and close, just like a normal, rounded, good speech, and not a monologue. So if you think that uh, the next Jimmy Carr will win the humorous speech contest, that probably won't be possible. I'll skip the international speech contest and evaluation contest in the interest of time because we're not doing them just yet, and I'm sure we'll have other opportunities later on this year. So let's talk a little bit about protest and disqualification. Very important topic here. Nobody wants to talk about it, but they are important. Protests are limited to eligibility, originality, and reference to another contestant or another contestant's speech, and must only, and I repeat, only be lodged by voting judges and or contestant. Any protest must be lodged with the chief judge or and the contest chair prior to the contest being adjourned. The chief judge, the contest chair, the voting judges and contestant must not consider protest from audience members. I know that might be difficult at times, but put your fingers in your ear and do not listen to what the person next to you might say or mutter whilst you are doing your ballot. Before a contestant can be disqualified on the basis of originality or for referencing another contestant's speech, the contestant must be given an opportunity to respond to the voting judges. And a majority of the voting judges must concur in the decision to disqualify. Contest chair can also disqualify a contestant on the basis of eligibility. And last but certainly by no means least, all decisions of the voting judges are final. Now, on to props and electronic devices. Contestants who plan to use props, including but not limited to any kind of electronic devices, music, PowerPoint, virtual backgrounds for those conducting online club meetings, must notify the contest chair prior to the contest so that we are aware those things will happen. Contestant must abide by any venue restrictions on the use of props. Let me give you an example. If you think you can bring a lion to a humorous contest because you've got one in your garden, please check the venue is okay with bringing a lion to the stage, just in case, and also for the safety of the attendants. All props must be set during the one minute of silence prior to the contestant's speech and removed from the stage in the minute of silence following the speech. True story, try to avoid moving furniture. It's unlikely to be possible within a minute. So if you want to bring a cupboard, chest of drawers or something of this nature, you might want to think a little bit about ensuring that it fits within a minute or think of another prop. However, as a contestant, you may enlist somebody else to help you with a prop and the setup. And um, last but not least, if a contestant is unable to demonstrate this, the prop cannot be used during the contest. So very important to uh, share and disclose what you may be doing to the contest chair so that uh, uh, you do not find, in a, find yourself in the difficult positions. Right, I'm almost done on my little monologue here before I open up for questions and answer. What I've done here is a list of very simple resources. The speech contest page on the Toastmasters website, very important, very useful. However, although Toastmasters International has updated the rule book, which you'll be able to find very easily, and I'm sure you've all read many times over already, those Updated rule books have not been added to the contest kits on the Toastmasters website. So if you download those, eh, you will find some problem. You'll find yourself uh, in a bit of a pickle, at least for the time being. I am told by HQ that those will be corrected and updated by the end uh, within about a month, um, but they are not able to give an exact time. So for the time being, please look at each individual resources 
and not the contest kits from the Toastmasters website if you want the latest and greatest information. Our District 91 website contains a ton of resources um, that have been built over the years, many of which will also point to the Toastmasters website. Um, there will be some uh, scripts for the various briefings that you may follow, and we're in a process of updating those scripts for those few areas that have changed since last year. Now, as I noted, the Toastmasters contest kits on the Toastmasters website do not yet have the latest copies of the rulebook or the judge's certification of eligibility and code of ethics or the speaker's certification of eligibility and originality. So the three documents are not on the contest kit on the official Toastmasters website. So what I've done is I've created for you two contest kits for the table topics and numerous speech contest in the meantime. And again, those links here will get you to a zip file that will contain everything that you need to have so that you don't have to worry about, oh, which link do I follow? Please use those links. You will get the latest and greatest. For those of you with an eagle eye, if you do look very, very carefully to the um, forms for the judges and the speakers, you may see some errors and discrepancies compared to the rule book. I have already shared those uh, errors with HQ and they will be making some corrections, hopefully very, very soon. But in any cases, whatever you see on the contest rulebook is what matters. The forms might have some errors. Please disregard those. The rulebook trumps the forms. And that has been confirmed also by World Headquarters. So, FAQ. I've uh, gathered a few questions that I can answer, but the first one that I had very recently is, can judges be online? At the club level, yes. Beyond, no. Very simple. I've got a few other questions that I've already answered in the, uh, in the context, and uh, that will be built um, over time as I get more questions. But in the meantime, please enjoy every moment of your contest coming up. And um, as I promised, we're now gonna have a little Q&A. So hopefully I've keeping you just about awake. It's not been too overwhelming. And as I said, those slides will be shared very, 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 very shortly. There we go. That's it for me. Any question? Oh no. Um, thank you very much. It's Steve Beer. Um, just to say, first of all, thank you very much for doing this today. Second of all, uh, I've tried to help out because Debbie lost connection with answering a whole lot of questions that you wouldn't have had time for if we wait if we waited till the end in the chat. There's been lots okay. of them. Um, I'm also grateful to Chris Walker, previous district judge, who's also helped me answer those questions. So just to let you know, there's loads of chat that I've dealt with. Um, uh, just thought I would point that out to you before you got started. Now, that's a very, very good point. Um, I will download those very uh before the end of this meeting and make sure that um the q a's are added to um well to the q a for everybody to to see thank you very much indeed all right so if your question has been answered let's not repeat it but if there are new questions um then i'm very happy to share that with you I will go with uh, uh, Alan. I see your hand is up. Thank you very Enchantment. much. Um, hopefully it's a nice, easy question. I was asked who provides the certificates at an area contest. My reply was that it is down to the club who's hosting. Um, and also then, therefore, is it down to the contest chair to uh, give them out at the end? Because I've looked in the rule book, couldn't find anything. So I've gone to the expert. Sure, very good question. So my answer will be twofold. One, in terms of protocol, the rules are very clear. The chief judge fills in the contest result form that is handed to the contest chair, who then spells out the result at the end of the contest. So that is the protocol as per the rule. In terms of who provides the physical certificates, um, there is no, to my knowledge, specific answer to that. If a club is hosting a contest, sure, the club could be providing those documents. 
My view would be that if an area director organizes a club hosted by a contest, the area director will have that conversation with all the clubs at the most appropriate area council meeting in order to decide on uh, uh, what to do. Uh, or simply the area director might simply print those out on behalf of the organizing team. But I do not, I do not believe there is a specific rule as to who should or shouldn't be uh, uh, printing those materials. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, next question will go to uh, Rosie, Rosie Matthews. Oh, thank you. Um, it was just a quick one. Can you repeat what you were saying about where there's only one contestant? I think that was at club level. Oh, what yes, very good. Yes. So what I was saying, um, it, it's a, a bit of a quirk of a rule, but um, if you are running um, a contest at the club level and only have one contestant, if that contestant happens to be over or under time, therefore being disqualified, that contestant may not progress to the next level. Right. Yeah, thank you. Okay, no problem at all. Very good. Next question, let's go to Mary. Mary Robson. Yeah, hi, thanks very much, Ono. I do have uh, two questions, if I'm allowed. Uh, firstly, the rules say that the contest chair will announce if there are any time disqualifications. Would also announce if there are any disqualifications for eligibility. That's not no. in the rule. Okay, so no. that's just Only not mentioned. The time. Only the time disqualifications yeah. are announced. Yeah, okay. Second question, if I can. Uh, with this new uh, introduction protocol of um, uh, you're welcome and thank you contest chair. If you have no AV equipment being used at the club contest, uh, not even a microphone, do you still have to do that introduction? There are no provision in the rule book to say that you may remove that part of the protocol. Um, I was talking to Debbie only a few days ago on that topic and we think it's important that this protocol is followed so that if your contestant goes all the way to the district, when there will be a microphone and perhaps even a division and certainly beyond, um, then all of our contestants will have had the practice of being introduced and having to follow this protocol, which I think is very important. Otherwise, you might get to a district level and maybe a semi-final and be caught um, afraid um, <laughs> at, at, a, at a new piece of protocol that you may not have been accustomed to. Yeah. Okay, fine. Thank you. Next question, let's go to uh, Andrew, Andrew Grainer. Thank you very much for doing this today. Uh, very informative. I did come in a bit late and you were finishing up something that I uh, was interested in hearing again. Uh, you said that clubs with uh, areas with four, four or less clubs uh, could have two contestants per contest go through? Correct. So areas okay. with four or fewer clubs may have up to two contestants progressing to the area contest. And equally, a division with four or fewer areas may have two contestants progressing from each area to the division contest final. And that is for each uh, contest type? to contest it. Oh, each contest type, okay. absolutely, yes. All right, thank you, thank you. Okay, no problem at all. Uh, next question, let's go to uh, Lucy. Thank you, Arno. Um, relating to what Andrew just asked, actually, um, if you have, say, five clubs, which is the case in my area, but one of them is an online club who will not necessarily be progressing on to the area level, um, would that rule pertain? In other words, would you yes. be able to move forward or not? No. So the, the rule is the, the rule is very clear. So it's eight weeks prior to the contest if your area has four or fewer clubs. And the rule does not state uh, whether those clubs are online, hybrid or in person. The rule is based on the number of clubs. So if you have five clubs, even though one or even two perhaps may not compete, you are still only allowed to progress one member to the next level. Okay. Uh, next question, let's go to uh, Gillian. Hi, Anand. Hi. 
Um, thank you very much for that. That was great. I just have a quick question about a chief judge at a club level. Do they need to be qualified on pathways to level one and two or, or do they just need no, to be a member? They just need to be a paid member of the club. Okay. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. I'm doing OK with table topics today. I'm quite happy with that. Excellent. All right. Next. Oh, Swarajit, you might have a tough one for me. Swarajit. Hi. Um, yeah, it's, it's a question I asked in the chat, and I I don't really know if I understood the answer from Steve. I'm so sorry about that. But my question was, if I'm sat in the audience at my club uh, or any contest, and I'm sat next to one of the co uh, contestants, and I see one of the other the contestant on stage has perhaps plagiarized something, um, but they you know they've broken the rule. Can I nudge my club mate next to me and say, I think you should lodge a protest. I'm not aware of a rule that says you may or may not. Um, integrity of the protest uh, dictates that only judges and contestant may lodge a protest. Um, so as a contestant, I would argue that uh, you may not listen, just like as a judge, you may not listen to what happens around you. Just that, and one of the reasons to also keep in mind is as you progress through the different level of the contest, uh, typically the contestant would also be separate from the audience and that issue would not necessarily happen. So as a matter of practice, what I could recommend to area division and district level is to keep the contestant perhaps on the front row of um, of the audience or perhaps in the back room where they can still uh, witness the, 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 the contest. Uh, to be together, um, not separate as they would be for table topic or, or, or evaluation, but in a way to sort of separate the contestant from the rest of the room so that they may not also be distracted by what may or may not happen in the audience. It just it just seems a bit strange that only very few people can know whether something is plagiarized, uh, you know, and therefore lodge a protest. You know, you have, it has to be 10 or so people or 20 contestants and judges that. Yeah, no, I, I, you know. I, I understand the, but the, the rule is very clear that only contestants or um, judges may lodge a protest. Okay. All right. Any other question while we're here? We have another few minutes available for us to uh, answer. Suzanne, hello. Good afternoon. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Good morning from the US. Uh, a judge at the club level only has to have paid with no experience in being um, an evaluator. At the club level, yes. Beyond from area onwards, they need to have uh, uh, been level one, level two, uh, which is the qualification for uh, area and above, which means that they will have had uh, to perform an evaluation. Okay, thanks. The, the, the other thing, and that's actually a very interesting question. So a speech evaluation is not the same as judging a contest. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's something that is sometimes, um, I don't wanna say overlooked, but it's sometimes very difficult to uh, to do. And maybe there is, um, I know there was, I think last week, uh, an, another webinar that went into um, the detail of uh, our judging and how we, we judge. Um, I just didn't have time to go over some of these uh, elements today, but that's certainly something that, um, that I'm sure we can run uh, over the next few months is um, uh, some tailored information around judging. So the judging form has a number of different criteria, which will be different for each of the contest. And uh, those criteria, again, on that, uh, on those ballot forms and judging forms, they also have some very specific criteria on how to perform the judging. So that would be my biggest recommendation. If you are a judge, even if it is the first time you're judging, do read the front and the back of those forms to get as much detailed information as, uh, as you have. I will also say that the Toastmasters International website has a mini webinar, I think it's about 20, 25 minutes on how to judge a contest. 
And that's actually a very good point. I'll see if I can add that to the um, to the resources. Um, I'll take a note of that because I think that could be very useful. Thanks. Okay. Sorry, Arno, just to let you know, it's uh, six o'clock. We're almost finished with the webinar time. Okay. Um, just let everybody know if you'd like to run over and I'll keep the recording going. I think well, we've answered already quite a few questions, so maybe I can squeeze in one last question from uh, uh, from Fran that I just saw a hand raised, and then we'll uh, uh, and then we can uh, we can close for today. Thank you, Arno. Just go back to that question about plagiarism, because not everybody would necessarily pick it up. Could you not then approach the chief judge and mention it? No. Well, you can if you are a judge or a contestant. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, that concludes our hour together today. The meeting was recorded, so I'm sure it will be shared, put on YouTube somehow. Um, I will make